I nearly missed it today on the, the message. When I, when I myself, because of my calling, when I spend a lot of time in prayer, uh, what happens is revelation knowledge mostly. And Friday and Saturday, you know, we had Friday, Saturday prayer here. I, I wrote 10 pages, which I thought was the message today. And, but it's not. <laughs> yes, sir. I told Alan, I sent Alan a text today right after his message. I said, you didn't use my verses, but you did preach part one. And that's been happening a lot. He, he was teaching, you know, it's, it'd be a shame to go your whole life, even as a Christian, and to love God and go to church and, and maybe live even a pretty righteous and holy lifestyle. Thank God for that. We're all about all of that. But never get to the place where you trust God enough. To step out because it's really true people that come here usually they have the problem of I can't hear God when they come and so we just teach them what Dave taught us if they'll do that a few months down the road they're going to have a bigger problem <laughs> well I heard God but what he's telling me to do is really scary is it impossible yes you probably heard him He's not calling you to, asking you what you can do. He's calling you to become a vessel so he can do what only he can do. And Alan was teaching, starting with Elijah, Elijah, who heard God, but he had to obey God. And he didn't try and rush God, and he didn't try and squeeze God into his plan. He waited and followed God's plan. And that's, that's part one of the message. See... It's one thing to get to the place where you can hear God. Every Christian has that ability. I'm telling you right now. My sheep hear my voice. Okay. But the harder part is becoming dead enough so that when you do, well, dead enough. I got a little checker that time. Don't usually. Dead enough is part of it. Knowing him enough to trust him to step out of the boat onto the waters. When it sure looks like certain death. So that's what Paul said. He said we've received the sentence of death within ourselves. Meaning. If we stay here Lord they're going to kill us. What do you say we do? I say stay. Paul said the reason for that is that we would learn not to trust in ourselves. But in the living God who raises the dead. Don't worry. He'll, he'll take care of you. And if the worst happens and they stone you to death like they did Paul one time. I just read it again yesterday. They stoned him and they thought, they thought he, were dead. he were dead. <laughs> they thought he was dead. The disciples gathered around him praying. I believe the Lord raised him up. Paul said, I had to learn. You talk about not learning not to trust in yourself. I'm pretty sure none of you had the power to raise yourselves from the dead. <laughs> See, that's what Paul was talking about. I have to trust him that far. Well, with me and Alan, it wasn't quite yet trusting him that far. He said, can you trust me to make your monthly payments? And both of us would have, store on a, would have swore on a stack of Bibles six foot tall. Yes, I trust him. He is my provider until we had to. <laughs> Do you obey him? Then you find out. Maybe I'm not quite the faith giant I thought I was. Maybe I don't quite know him as well as I thought I did. Yes, sir. Go down. So Alan taught part one. Now, I know we have we, people. Listen, uh, I don't care if you're in Australia, New Zealand, Germany. Imok they're f way off in deepest, darkest Immokalee. Uh, <laughs> Canada. <laughs> Dayton, Ohio. I don't, uh, wherever you are. You know if you're. A part of this vision. You know if the Lord has put a hook in your jaw. And drawn you here. See. So I'm just going to do quickly. A quick little review. And then we're going to obey the Lord today. We try and do that every time. But this one is a little different. Let me quickly. The, the conference that we had in October. Although many wonderful things were taught. The foundation of that conference was reestablishing the vision of the prayer center this is not a normal church I thank God 
and I, I don't, how do you use the word normal? Uh, this is not really a church, if you want to, it may be called that. It's not. It's a training center, but it's not that either exactly. What it is, it's a mission that God gave through Pastor Dave all those years ago. It's, a, it's like a one-line blueprint to take a group of people far enough into God to bring the supernatural power of God to manifest in this earth again. That's the mission. And we, it's easy to get sidetracked off of your assignment. One man said, I, I don't know who said it first, but one man said, if you want to destroy a man's vision, give him two. And that keeps happening. Uh, it's happened again recently. It keeps happening where we, we wind up, and they're all good things, but they're diversions from what the Lord has called this place to do. Yes, sir. If you want to see the heart of the prayer center, I mean, I'm, I'm, for those that can't see me, I'm holding up our prayer box that has these pictures of individuals on it that are impossible cases. I usually talk about Tommy Perez. He's a born with cerebral palsy. He's 44 now, lives in New York. Modern medical science has not a thing in the world to offer him other than comfort and food and water and a wheelchair and those kind of things. But there is no answer in the natural for Tommy Perez. How many things God might have an answer? I want to give another one here, which is uh, Tori. I know her picture's on here somewhere. Here she is, right here in the front. This is Victoria. Around here we call her Tori. Tori was born with a partial brain. She has enough brain for her motor skills to breathe and for her lungs to work and kidneys and all of that. But she's in her teens now, I think, approaching 20. Can't talk, can't... Um, communicate um, this is not God's plan this is not God's will uh, modern medical science cannot re fin can I say finish creating the brain that Tory should have they, at this point they can't transplant a brain someday I think they will but even that wouldn't help Tory Tory needs her own brain and Right now, there's nowhere on earth, medical or spiritual, where you can take a Tory, where any of these, any of these pictures on here, there's nowhere on earth we can take them and bring them back healed. How many of you know, if Jesus was still running his ministry on earth himself in his own physical body, like Dave said one time, it might, I might get on the waiting list, you know, if Jesus was still operating over in Jerusalem. And it might take me six months on the waiting list to get Tory there. But I'll guarantee you one thing. If I could get Jesus' hands on Tory, she'd come in back with a brain. <laughs> Tommy Perez would come back and stand right here giving his testimony Standing up, not in a wheelchair, and tell what great things the Lord has done for him. Now see, that is the vision of the prayer center. It's good to do things. We help people along the way. We've, we have fed the poor, um, fed the hungry. It's fine to do all of those things. It's wonderful, actually, to do all those things. But see, God has called people specifically to do that. There are people, a mockly, uh, his name is Bronk. Pastor Bronk in Immokalee was just telling recently there's a wonderful ministry a few miles from his church down there in another city, but close, less than 10 miles away, that has a feeding program. He said nobody in that whole county, two or three counties around, should ever go hungry because they get, there's a wonderful feeding program. He says what we should do, since we have this assignment, if we want to help feed the poor, we need to give money to them. And help them feed the poor. Because that's what God's called them to do. That's their assignment. But see we cannot get derailed here. We are on assignment from God. We have not arrived there yet. Now I want to mention this. Uh, we've recently. And I think I mentioned this at Calling in the Lost last week or the week before. You know what it feels like to me? It's like. 
if, if, if the prayer center, when I say the, from here on out, when I say the prayer center, I mean you. If you're listening, if you're connected, I don't care if you're Australia, New Zealand, wherever you are, you're part of this. I feel like we've kind of been on a side, we've been on a sidecar for a while. The train has been, if you allowed me a passenger train, we've been sidelined for a little while. But a few weeks ago, I felt a clunk. I heard a clunk. You know, if you take a passenger train that's been sitting idle for a while, and all of a sudden that locomotive, they fired up, and it engages. If you listen, you, you can hear clunk, clunk, clunk behind you, because what's happening? The slack is coming out of every car. Every, that coupling, the slack is coming out of it. And I said, I feel like our train is engaged again. And we're moving straight forward. And you can feel the weight of the cars moving. And it's not any of us. We're not, we're not the locomotive. The Holy Spirit is the locomotive. And Jesus is the conductor. But this train is moving forward again. I can feel it. I can feel it in the natural. Now, let me undo that. Which way? All right. So how, one, of the re, one of the ways he's got us engaged again, he gave me a little mini vision that I call the wall of fire. Be, turn to Matthew 3. We'll get a few verses in here today. Matthew 3. And you can put a, a marker, believe it or not, in Revelations 1. I'm going to go there also. But I saw this wall of fire. And it was, I looked to the right. I couldn't see the end of it. I looked to the left. I couldn't see the end of it. I looked straight up. I couldn't see over it. And the, the message was real clear. I didn't hear a voice, but the message was real clear. It's right in front of me. There is no way forward from here without going through the fire. There's just no way. If we're going to go forward, you're going through the fire. Other than that, you're going to stay where you are. Well, that brings us to Matthew 3. Look at verse 11. This is John the, ba John the Baptist talking. He says, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. But he that cometh after me is mightier than I. Now, who's that? That's Jesus. Whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost. Now, notice. And with what? And with fire. Now, we have taught a lot about the baptism in the Holy Ghost. We have not taught so much about the fire. Okay? But where we're going now, we've got to talk about the fire. Now, remember that the vision he gave me about a year ago. Remember he, he would show me our, our lit candle? Remember that? The Spirit of Man is the candle of the Lord. And he was talking to us somewhat then about the baptism in the Holy Ghost. So I knew our candle is lit. Thank God there's a fire on the inside of us, which is the nature of God. It's got... You know, all, all of the nature of God in it. That's what happens when you get born again. And then I saw this fiery tornado that was, remember we showed, I showed little pictures of it and movies of it. And it had a sound. And man, I mean, that thing was, you wouldn't want to face that thing. It was, I mean, I mean power, you talk about raw, unmitigated power. And I knew that, we all knew that was a type of the Holy Spirit and fire. But what was the next vision? We saw the candle in that fiery tornado. You remember that? You remember that? Well, he was teaching about us then. Now he's putting us in it now. He's putting us in it now. So you're in verse 11, go on to verse 12. Whose fan, in fact, I'm going to read them together, Matthew 3, 11 and 12. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that come... Let's just start with repentance. <laughs> Don't leave out repentance. Okay. But he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor. And gather his wheat into the garner. Now notice. But he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. 
That Greek word translated purge is Strong's G1245. And it means to cleanse perfectly. To cleanse perfectly. If something has been cleansed perfectly, if you go back and inspect it with your white glove, you going to find any smudge? No, you're not. Now, it's one thing to stick your finger in the fire. I saw me walk up to the wall of fire. Ooh, scary. Stuck my finger in it. <laughs> Ow, I'm done, Lord. I think that's kind of where we've been. Angie saw a vision that I want to put in here now. This is kind of where the prayer center is. She saw it this week, I think. She saw us kind of like trees. We were walking up to that wall of fire. And we weren't... The, the trees, instead of having these long branches that go out like pretty trees do... They were kind of all chopped off stubby branches. But we were covered in them. Can we say nubs? <laughs> Maybe a little more than nubs, you know what I mean? <laughs> little short stubby branches. And we're looking at this wall of fire making a decision. See? And the message there is it's not like there have not been purgings before. Right. See, this is a message to the prayer center. To the people that have been here a while too. It's not like the, there's not like there, it is not like there has not been purging to this point. Yes, sir. But again, in Alan's message, I'm going to elaborate on that little vision that the Lord gave me a, a few years ago. Because I know the love of money. Sue's been married to me 44 years. Y'all pray for Sue. <laughs> <laughs> and she knows, she's lived with me during those times when the love of money was my God. I literally bowed down to it. All the time. All, every thought I had was money, money, money. How's this going to affect our, where we live? How's this going to affect the car we drive? And so forth. Everything was that way. And, and, uh, but when we got radically saved, a big chunk of that was cut off. I mean, I've, it's been hard to motivate me with money ever since. But still, there was enough of it alive in me that I got hooked and snared and drawn in to the false prosperity gospel during the 80s. There was enough, still enough alive in me. Now, I wasn't going to spend my life running after it, but if God's offering it, I was going to go out. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I didn't know it was false. Thank God for this message. It taught me how to loose the true teacher on the inside of me. But then, so I know what I'm, the reason I'm saying all that, I know there's been purging. The love of money does not control me near like it did before I got saved, and not nearly today like it did even in the 80s. I've been purged of that. And so, you know, you get to thinking you're somewhat among them. You know, I've, I've, I, yes, sir, I've been through this purging. Mm-hmm. I'm ready for the millions now. Yes, sir, gospel entrepreneur, you found your man. <laughs> you put the millions on me, I'm ready to give it. Mm -hmm. And that's when he showed me the vision that Alan alluded to this morning. See, if you take a gallon, you know, a good old-fashioned coffee can, the metal kind, not these stupid plastic ones, you know. <laughs> How many remembers the metal cans? We used to, uh, you take a gallon, a gallon, big old Folgers can, get the coffee out of it, you know, you go fill that thing up with gasoline. Now, here, here's this vision. First, I saw a pretty good bonfire going. I knew it was greed on the inside of me. I knew it was the love of money. You take a gallon can of gasoline... And you pour it on that bonfire, you know what's going to happen. Whoosh! Right? All right. Next vision, I've got the same amount of gas in the can. I've got a gallon Folgers can of gasoline. But this time, there's a little candle, just a little flicker of a flame. Just a little candle, not a bonfire anymore, just a candle. But you know what happens? Exactly the same thing. Whoosh! He says, I said, mortify. I said to mortify. Put it to death. See? And we're all in some measure. See, so that, that told me I've got a stubby limb <laughs> on my tree. It's been pruned way back from where it was. Okay? But there's enough stub there. 
It's time to go. It's time to thoroughly cleanse the floor. Well, good. so it's one thing to stick your finger in the fire. It's another thing to stand in a furnace of purging. Now, we read that prophecy a few nights ago, and it's available at, at the, both websites. It's called Stand in the Furnace of Purging, but you can imagine what it's saying. It's not pleasant. It's not pleasant on the flesh. But I'll tell you this, your spirit and your father is rejoicing every moment you stay in there. But if we're going to go, and to go where he's called us to go, there's no avoiding this wall of fire. That train will stop again. I don't want that train to stop again. Let's get on to revival. It's time for Tori to have her brain. Yes. Amen? Yes. Oh, my Lord. All right. Now, this one is a complete purging. It says, he shall thoroughly, that means perfectly, cleanse his floor. You remember the, the vision, the demonstration we have in the Gospels where Jesus made a scourge and he went into the temple? Hello, you are the temple of God, right? So here we see Jesus coming in, and what's he doing? He's driving out everything out of that temple that is not of God. And you know what he said about that temple? This house shall be called a house of prayer. How do you drive it out? He might be giving us a clue. Prayer. Fasting. Hallelujah. Every gardener knows there is more than one pruning. Isn't that right? It is the Father that does the pruning. And he says, you already pruned. He, Jesus told him, I don't, we're not turning to all these scriptures. We're not in kindergarten class today. Okay, <laughs> you, you know these verses. He says, you're already pruned through the word that I've... It says clean. It's the same word as prune. You're already clean, pruned through the word that I've spoken unto you. But my Father, he's going to prune you. Even though you're bearing fruit, he's going to prune you. So that you bear more fruit. Hmm. John G. Lake speaks of a sanctification of the mind. Not just the spirit. You know what John Wesley called it? I wrote it down so I wouldn't say it wrong. John Wesley. He said sanctification. Is possessing the mind of Christ. And all the mind of Christ. <laughs> and we can live there. Where we think like him. Sue puts me to shame sometimes. That she has a different calling. We're one ministry with two manifestations. I can't do what she does. She doesn't. She probably could do what I do. But we wouldn't do it the same way. But we'll be sitting there you know. And me it, I'm a teacher. It, my mind is usually thinking along those lines. But they'll, they'll come on with one of those amber alerts. You know a missing child. Or a senior alert. You know we've got so and so. That's Gary's age now that walked off. <laughs> <laughs> Thank God I don't do that, and I never will. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> but anyway, see, my first thought is, boy, you know, man, that's, that's bad. You, Sue's first thought, every time, always, let's pray right now. So, get, here, she'll reach over and get my hand. Let's pray. She, she's kingdom-minded. She's spirit-minded. She's the mind of Christ is in her, in those areas, better than it is in me, because she's ready. To, she knows if we pray, that'll change. God's will will be done, see. So, praise God. Yes, sir. All right. Is that it? Anyone may make sure. Yes, sir. Okay. The rest of that comes in another lesson. So, all of that really is introduction. And a follow-up, a part two to what Alan was saying this morning. I thought Alan's message was the perfect introduction. You have to come to the place where you're willing to trust God. And what God's about to say to us right now is going to require some change. That you're going to have to be willing to trust him. Now this is deep, calleth unto deep. I hope you're ready for this. There is no such thing as change without change. <laughs> I'm tired just a minute. I got to recover just a moment here. Did you, did you get that? It's a hard one. If you don't do something different, your life's not going to change. There's no such thing as change without change. 
Yes, sir. Revelations chapter 1. How many of you know Christ is in you? Christ in us, the hope of glory. But you've got to understand that Christ himself, Christ in his glorified body, with his own spirit, is seated at the right hand of the Father. Would you say Christ was in John? You know, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that John? Would you say Christ was in him? And here the man's lived uh, 80, 90 years at this point, served Jesus for a lifetime. Yet when he beheld this Jesus who sits at the right hand of God, not the nature that's in him, when he who sits on the throne at the right hand of the God walked up, John felt, he fell to the floor like a man dead. Let's read that part. It's good. You've got to understand who it is you're serving. Got to understand who it is that's speaking to you. You've got to understand who it is we're obeying. It's this one right here. So let's pick it up in Revelations 1. We'll start in verse 9. I, John, who am also your brother and companion in tribulation, and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, in the isle that is called Patmos, for the work... He says, why am I here? Patmos was a penitentiary island. There was nothing else going on there but a penitentiary. That's all it was. And they broke rocks, okay, for Rome. And he's 90 some odd years old is what history t says. Can you imagine? 90 some odd years old. Why was he on the Isle of Patmos? He tells you. For the word of God. And for the testimony of Jesus Christ. He would not deny the Lord. He would not deny that I saw him myself raised from the dead. He would not deny anything of the word of God. Even if they put you on a penitentiary island in your 90s to break rocks. Put, put me there. I will not deny him. And even there, most of us would be complaining. But even there on the Isle of Patmos, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. I bet he was praying in tongues. I can't prove that. But he was in the Spirit. He was worshiping the Lord. He was not occupied with his fleshly problems. He was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. And I heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet. God, I tremble when I come to this passage. Something in me trembles. I could, it might be, it's a, maybe it's a fear of the Lord, you know. He heard a voice. I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. What thou seest, write in a book and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus and unto Smyrna and unto Pergamos, and unto Thyatira and unto Sardis and unto Philadelphia and unto Laodicea. John says, I turned to see the voice that spake with me. Being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks, and in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. Now get this. His head and his hairs were white like wool, white as snow. His eyes were as a flame of fire. His feet like unto fine brass. And if they burned in a, as if they burned in a furnace. And his voice as the sound of many waters. He had in his right hand a seven, seven stars. And out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. His countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. Now get this. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. He laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Thank God. Amen. And I have the keys of hell and of death. Write the things which thou hast seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. The mystery of the seven stars which thou saw in my right hand and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. And the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. Now, that's pretty King Jamesy. Let's bring it for real. What happens here? The Lord gives, can I say, his present hour speaking at the time for those individual seven churches. 
This was his present hour speaking. This, and you can, we can go through the list. He had different instructions for different churches. Okay? Partly because they had different problems, but partly because they lived in different areas. Different assignments for them. But he knew exactly where they were. He knew exactly what needed to happen. Let's just take Ephesus. Okay, let's just read this part now. I'm going to, then we're going to get into it. Yes, sir. Okay, look up here first. Look up here. We're going to look at Ephesus first in a minute. If, G, if, that, if that one, if that Jesus there, the only one there really is, if he was to walk through the wall right now, first off, the presence, you wouldn't be able to, you, you're, you, you couldn't hold back the water from your eyes. The presence would fill the room. There wouldn't be anybody moving around. We might all be on our face. But I'll guarantee you, whatever he said, whatever, would that be the most important thing in your life? Would anything else really matter? Everything else goes on the shelf, doesn't it? Whatever he says to us, isn't that what we do? Let's take Ephesus for, for one. Because this, Ephesus is a good church. Now look what he says here. This is a good church. I think, the, I think the Lord likes the prayer center. I really do. Okay, but now he liked, he liked Ephesus. Watch this. Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works, and thy labor, and thy patience. And how thou canst not bear them which are evil. And thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not. And hast found them to be liars. Now let's just stop for a moment. He says they're doing good works. Their doctrine is important to them. This church has matured to the place. It's not blown around by every wind of doctrine. Just because some dude comes in saying he's an apostle. They're going to check what he preaches to find out if he is an apostle. Amen? Pretty good church. I like this church. Let's go on. And has borne and has patience and for my name's sake has labored and has not quit, not fainted. That's a good church. And notice they're doing it for his name's sake. They're not even trying to do it, you know, like out of a self-motivation. They're doing it for his name's sake. And he's, he's proud of them for that. He's bragging on them. This is good. I like this church. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee. Because thou hast left thy first love. I'm telling you it's so easy. To get involved. And so busy with ministry. And works. And labor. And patience. And steadfastness. And doctrine. And all of those things. Where you come to the place. One day you wake up and you go. Or he may say. You've left your first love. He gives them instruction what to do. Thank God for Jesus. He doesn't tell you the problem and walk off. He tells you what to do. That's the instruction. That's, part, that's Alan's part one message today using Elijah as a perfect example. You do what he tells you to do until he tells you the next thing to do. But when he tells you what to do, you do that. You don't go do something else. Even if you don't like the circumstances you find yourself in, what's that got to do with being in his will? You've got me at this place. I'm the only Christian there. They're all mean and tell dirty jokes. Pray I get out of here. Wait a minute. Did he put you there? Be the light. You ought to be proud of yourself. You're, what I mean is he, he trusts you. With those that he's trying to save. For you to be the light. Right where you are. That's. Man. Verse 5. Remember therefore from whence thou hast fallen. And repent. And do the first works. Now he's not telling them to stop doing the works they're doing. But he's saying. The most important thing to you, Ephesians, I'm the king, I'm the one you're serving, and I'm here to tell you the most important thing, you need to repent and do the first works. 
Well, what was the first works when you first fell in love with him? I, don't, I can't speak for you. All I know is about me. I didn't care. I didn't get up with bedhead in the morning, my ugly blue robe. All I wanted to do was sit there and read my Bible. Wasn't understanding 5%, 3% of what I was reading, and it didn't matter. It was like food for my spirit, that new creature on the inside of me. I'd, just, I'd read and cry. So who can tell you? I'd read and cry. I didn't care about work, really. I just, and I just loved him, and I'd talk with him. That's, that's your first love. Spend time with him. So he said, repent and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly and remove thy candlestick out of its place, except thou repent. That's enough. Now, the point is this. If the king of glory, the one we read about there, if he walks in and he says, I found a problem or I have an assignment, here are the instructions. That's what we do. <laughs> that is what we do. If it interferes with other stuff, it interferes. Alan, again, used some of Dave's old vintage stuff this morning. You may have to cut a bedroom off your house. May not need that extra bedroom, that extra TV in the back room. May have to get rid of the Mercedes and get a clunker. But if the Lord is telling you to spend more time in prayer, you need to spend more time in prayer. Isn't that right? Now... We said all that because right now God is using Pastor Bronk Flint. Not that he's not using others. He is. But it seems to be right now that the Lord, regarding this train moving ahead again, and we're going through the wall of fire, going through this purging, it seems right now the Lord is especially speaking through Pastor Bronk. The handout that you received when you came in are several prophecies in a row, practically. Some of them came... In a, if you didn't get one, raise your hand. And our, uh, our handsome ushers will give you one. Hallelujah. Anybody on that side need, need one? Doing good? All right. All right. I'm going to wait till they have them because this is important. And <clears throat> Derek and Diana have already uh, separated out these prophecies. I, I would like for you to hear them in Bronx voice. Okay, there's an anointing. I, I had to almost, I ha almost had to stop it at the gym. I was play, play, playing one of them on my ear things at the gym. And I don't remember which one it was, maybe the second or third one. I mean, an anointing came, a presence came. I was surprised everybody in the gym could stand up. <laughs> Now, that may not happen as you hear it today, but boy, it got me. That's what I'm telling you. It got me. And I think it's important that you, yes, sir, that you, yes, sir. This first one is called Bring Me Gold. And it's the very first thing that happened after Bronk left the conference, got back to Immokalee, stood in his own pulpit. I'm sure he was thinking he was going to preach. But instead of that, the Lord spoke. Now, we're going to play them one at a time. I've got my own copy here where I've highlighted a few things. We may have some comments, but I think we'll get through. There's four of them, I think, four or five. We're going to get through all of them in this service. And I think we'll still have you out by about noon. Need another one up here. Everybody got a copy? Now, this is your copy. Please mark on this. Circle words. If the, if the Holy Spirit... If he emphasizes something as we go through there, you ought to see mine. I got red markings all over these things. I got words circled. I got instructions out in the margins. This is mine and you can't have it. Because <laughs> I'll just tell you plain, I flat intended on obeying him. If, if he's going to come like this, see to me this is no different than the one that spoke to John. It's coming by the Holy Ghost, but the Holy Ghost only speaks what he hears. He's not our Lord. The Holy, uh, Jesus is our Lord. The Holy Spirit is here to bring us His Lordship. So to me, as you read this, now, I know how it speaks to me. It it's, requires change in Gary's life. I believe it's going to require change in your life. 
But how else are we going to go through the fire? And if he's going to come and give us precise, detailed instruction on how to do it, shouldn't we do it? Or why else, what are you going to say to him on that day? Hallelujah. All right. If you'll go ahead and play, uh, bring me gold. Have I not asked you, Jesus. being a body from the very beginning, to bring forth that in the earth, which I've laid my hand on you to bring forth, saith the Spirit of grace. I caution you again and encourage you again and solicit from you again as my dear children to bring me gold tried by fire, saith the Spirit of grace. And I do not speak specifically of the trying of fire by testings and trials of which your faith will often be. But I'm asking you to come and complete the purging process, saith the Spirit of grace. Do not trade your gold for brass. Do not trade your gold for brass, for have I not asked you? Have I not selected you? Have not I cautioned you that I have not selected you above others that you would go in a way of pride or arrogance but yet I have given you a calling that no one can achieve in the earth except through prayer and except through fasting saith the spirit of grace except through going into my word into things of depth and promise have I not given you a mandate from the very beginning, saith the Spirit of grace. And I've gathered your hearts and souls here as one to bring forth that mandate of prayer, saith the Spirit of the Lord. Go into me like you never have. Determine in this year to come that you'll make this a place of prayer inside of you like you've never known. Many will grab you by the shoulder and by the arm and say, come do this with me. The natural tendency will be to show your love to them and to show your allegiance to me, saith the Lord. That you'd involve yourself in this and that and the other. But I say unto you as a church and I say unto you as elders and I say unto you believers, that what I've laid my hand on you for as kings and priests is to go into the prayer closet. Many will reason and your natural mind will reason and Satan will come and say, but I've called you to the streets and I've called you to feed the poor and I've called you to do all these things. And yes, in me, I will bring those things to pass. But it will not be through an operation of the flesh like most of the church knows. But I will bring forth in you an exact replica of my firstborn, the one who walked in front of you. Yes, he fed the poor, and yes, he brought forth ministry everywhere he went. It was because he knew me in a private place. It was because he continued to purge himself continually and walk in a place of commitment to me, saith the Spirit of grace. I'm asking you to narrow your vision like never before. I'm asking you to zero in like never before. I'm calling you, saith the Spirit of grace, to become laser focused like never before. Busyness is not a sign. An over busyness is not a sign unto you or a confirmation to you that great works are being done and yet there will be times where you will be very busy doing my work saith the Lord listen and hearken I have few I have very few that are willing to do this I have very few that are willing to hide themselves in the secret place and go into my word and go into my spirit and to deny their flesh 
the flesh will give you many opportunities to minister in my name and yet I'll work a work there as much as I can but I have a very select few that will hide themselves and bring forth the anointing that causes a citywide and a statewide revival saith the Spirit of the Lord so I'm asking you kings and priests I'm asking you to come away with me to a place that I've solicited from you for many, many years. And I am pleased with you, saith the Spirit of grace. I am not disheartened with you, but I am pleased with your efforts so far. But I'm asking you not to quench the Spirit. For in not listening to these very words and reasoning them out in your own mind, and saying that is a man speaking that's a man speaking but I hear from God listen to these things judge these things saith the Spirit of the Lord judge them by the word understand this that I've called you aside I've called you to be a peculiar people unto me saith the Lord I've called you to walk in the spirit and deny the flesh and yet when you pray, you'll move mountains, saith the Lord. The earth has not seen people like you in many generations. I'm asking you to come away with me, my beloved. I'm asking you to come away with me, my beloved. Know me in intimacy and know me in my word like you've never known before. Let your world that you live in become a place of peace and quietness I promise you by my word and by my spirit that none of you including the ones speaking now have come into the place of peace and quiet like I have for you there is a stillness that will direct your day there is a stillness that will direct your life there is a stillness that cannot hear the offense Deafened ears cannot hear. And yet you will move out of a place of authority in my spirit continually, moving mountains and moving things in your life. And yet ears are still dull of hearing. For many of you presently, and many of that will hear, will think of other things and only hear this partially. But when you come to another place, you can hear it in more depth. And more depth will bring you to a greater depth, saith the Spirit of the Lord. I say unto you that your entire life is to be consumed in me, saith the Lord. Give unto me what brass and what silver cannot. I desire the fruit of the earth. I desire a great harvest, saith the Spirit of the Lord. I desire that all of you walk in all the gifts of the Spirit. All the gifts of the Spirit flowing through you. I desire that Joel's army, the army of the last day, would flow together. No weak and no sickly among you is my desire. For I've chosen you as a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation a peculiar people unto me hallelujah hallelujah now I think last Sunday night at calling in the lost I did a, a teaching on this prophecy called complete the purging process I recommend it to you I took it apart like a study and made it basically a study guide out of it trying to isolate the instructions that are in there okay uh, I have not had time and I may not do the rest of these we've got three or four more to listen to but let me just there's no such thing as change without change just take one old timers when he says pray like you have never prayed before now, for each of you, that means something. See, I know what that means to Gary Carpenter. That's a lot of prayer. If I go back to those early days, if he's really telling Gary, pray like you've never prayed before, I'm going to have to squeeze out somehow a lot of time 
and my life is going to change. That's what I'm talking about. Some of you, not looking at anybody, have never yet. Okay, another one, he says, go into my word like you've never done before. Some of you, not looking at anybody, have never yet taken Dave seriously about assimilating the New Testament 30 times. If you don't make a plan to do that, we'll be sitting here 10 years from now, and you still will not have assimilated it 30 times. So on Sunday night's message, I gave some calculations. If you want to get it done, working at it pretty steady, it's going to take you about two years. Okay? Those instructions are on Sunday night's message. The only reason I'm bringing this forward, if we don't do something to change, that's the difference between hearing and having ears to hear. Are you hearing what he's saying? If you are, you're going to have to make some changes. I went back to, uh, if you don't make a fasting schedule, I doubt your fasting life will change. Dave, I understand why there's fewer and fewer chairs being occupied. This is not the bless me and my four message, you know. <clears throat> if you don't make a prayer schedule, so you go, I'm going to pray more. Good, when? If you can't tell me, you probably can't tell you. In other words, you're just talking. In Texas or Oklahoma, we say you're all hat and no cattle. Got a big 10-gallon hat and got no cattle to back it up. I can tell you when I'm going. I know I'm going to be here Wednesday night. Wednesday night here lately has been prayer. There's, a, there's an hour and a half. Friday from noon till 7 right now. Saturday morning from 7 in the morning till noon. And he's really caught. He, you'll see later in these other prophecies, he mentions corporate prayer too. It's not, private prayer is wonderful. But he's also calling us to corporate prayer. There, you do know in revivals in, in history, the people got together and prayed. Sorry, I'm making, doing my shocked face. What? Yeah, the people got together and prayed. Hmm. So anyway, I recommend Sunday night's message, complete the purging process. And if you haven't heard these messages from the beginning, I would start with face the wall of fire, okay? Because I, in there, I did, uh, even Jesus himself, it's, it's one thing to be baptized in the Holy Ghost. It's another thing to walk in the power of the Spirit. Jesus had to be tested by the devil in the wilderness. Put that in prayer center terms. The devil was looking for any handle he could find. And if he would have found one, he would have turned Jesus with it. We have to complete the purging process or he's going to find your handle. Look at all the disgraces in the past. He's going to find your handle. And if it doesn't bring disgrace, he'll just turn you out of prayer. Or he'll turn you out of this mission or something's wrong at this church. I've got to go down to the other church. You know. Okay, enough on that one. Now, I think to everybody's surprise, including Bronx, the very next service that he did, there were two prophecies that came forward in that one. I think we'll do both of these uh, back to back. What The first one is called, You Who Have Ears to Hear. And the second one is called, Endure in the Fight. All right. He who has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit has to say, saith the Lord. For many will be dull in their hearing, not having ears to hear, because of the layers of flesh that still surround and abate and hold back the strength of the Spirit. But I say unto you that those who have ears to hear, that I've given you a Spirit inside of you. And I'm not speaking particularly of the Holy Spirit at this time. But I've given you a Spirit to conquer, to conquer your world and to conquer your flesh from the very beginning to stand without argument, head and shoulders above the domination of the flesh, to cast these things out and not live according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit, saith the Spirit of grace. This was the first measure. But this is not where I left you. 
I did not leave you to live the rest of your existence with your joy only in your ability to conquer sin. I have a much greater calling beyond that for you. For once you understand that you could conquer that person and live above in righteousness, I've asked you to come apart and conquer the world around you. And for this, you will need that spirit that comes by power to you through strength and through fire and through purging, saith the Spirit of grace. My spirit comes to burn up the last of anything left beyond the entrance into my kingdom. My spirit comes, my Holy Ghost comes to offer to each one of you the free will of choice of the whipping post where I as a father through my spirit will scourge away the remaining of anything left that has any effect upon you following me in the fullness of what I've asked you to do. Do not be mistaken. Do not let arguments arise in your heart and mind to delude the message of what I speak to you. I gave you the power at the very entrance into salvation to conquer those things that destroy the image which you call killer or deal breaker sins. That was done from the very moment of conception. But I'm asking those of you that will hear my voice and purge yourself through prayer and fasting and giving of thanks to come away with me into another level. Why would you rejoice all your life as to make it the only and the center part of your life that you're able to conquer your flesh? That to me was the beginning. I'm asking you to go forth and to conquer a world around you and to conquer your city through fastings and prayers and to bring forth and to destroy the last part of anything in you that is complacent towards these things, that is indifferent towards these things. For whosoever has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says, saith the Spirit of grace. Many, many will think often, but you lean heavily upon us, Lord. You lean heavily upon us from the pulpit and you lean heavily upon us from instruction. But has not my word said that as many as I love that I will chasten? And as many as will prune themselves and go through the fire, that I will likewise prune them again and again and again. Do not be ignorant of this understanding that there are not many in the earth at this present time that have turned aside to offer their bodies a living sacrifice. When I say not many, I'm not talking about that there is just a few in number. I'm talking about as in the proportionate of the church and especially the church in modern America. There are not many in proportion to that church that have turned aside to seek my face and cry out and abandon their flesh and abandon their world and abandon their aspirations and abandon the self-exalted and self-expressed life. I cannot make you do this. I will not make you do this. And this does not negate your coming to me at the end of your life in salvation and receiving whatever reward is available. But whoever will, whoever will lay down their life will reap a great harvest in this life for I will lay my hand upon you and your exaltation will be to do the works that my first begotten did 
It will become natural. It will become a flow to you and through you, saith the Spirit of grace. You will not have time for arguments. Doctrine will be of the utmost importance. But debates, speculations, theories, and all kinds of endless chatter will not be of any necessity. You will not have the time. You will walk past it to heal another and to raise another. Become deafened to the rhetoric of the church. Become deafened to the rhetoric of even some of your family members. For many who know me as in sonship do not know me in intimacy. My words are afar off to them, though I have a place in their heart as in salvation. Yet I cannot turn them to the right hand or to the left. I cannot turn them as I will saith the Spirit of grace. But those of you who have ears to hear, continue at a straightforward motion. Listen always. Obey always. Be quick to repent. For I do not have many in proportion. But the ones that I have will bring about this outpouring, saith the Spirit of grace. For many of your hearts are turned aside, fighting the battle, some on many fronts, financially, physically, emotionally. For the drain and the fight of the battle has been part of your distraction. But I say to you, lift yourself up, shake yourself. And let me stir you. Let me stir you beyond the place that you walk at today. Let this be a place where I infuse my strength into your hearts. That it goes beyond a determination of the mind, but a strength infused by my spirit to cause you to begin to continue day and night to pray the mysteries, to walk in my spirit and to pray in my spirit. Leave the parking lot today praying in the spirit. Fellowship at times all through the day with me and others, intermittent, praying. Find yourself praying in the spirit because in it, my desire is to lift you up. I desire to take you past the burdens and the fight. I've asked you to endure in the fight. I've asked you to endure in the fight, but I've not asked you to endure the things that have come that bring the fight. I've not asked you to endure sickness, depression, poverty, as to let them rule over you or lord over you. But I've asked you to endure a fight against them, a good fight. But let me take the weight of this fight, saith the Spirit of grace. While you are worshiping me and giving yourself over to tongues and to my word, know this. But I'm building you up on your most holy faith. I'm preparing inside of you a continual answer against those things that have come to lead you astray with such a force against your emotions that it's hard to stand. Let me shore you up. Let me be a father to you. Let me once again get over to you how much I love you as my sons and as my daughters. In my strength, in my affirmation of my love to you, there is a great strength, saith the Spirit of grace. Give yourself over to this place. The more you do it, the more you'll come up, the more you'll stand, 
when you forget for a day or a season, go right back in. I will continue to be there to remind you. You're not lost. You're mine. I know where you're at. Hallelujah. There is such treasure here. If you, if you will take this seriously and study, you don't need me to break it down. You need to read this, listen for his voice, li- and write down instructions how you're going to obey every sentence. Okay? Now, earlier we had uh, Briley May and my granddaughter Ashley come up. And uh, is Ashley supposed to abandon Briley May and just leave her crying to go, to go pray? Absolutely not. Is, a, is, a, is a, a husband and a father supposed to quit his job and neglect providing for his family? That is not. Hopefully, we're past those kind of babyhood things. But the truth of it is, you can pray in tongues while you're breastfeeding your baby. You can pray in tongues. He mentioned here, pray while you're leaving the parking lot. He's talking about windshield prayer. And in other words, pray. You can, you can get in a lot of prayer. But there's also things... That you can, okay, in Gary's life, I'm not going to tell you too much, but I, I forgot that Saturday was football day. I've been praying enough. Well, I got a little applause there. For, yeah. yeah. Sue, does, Sue can tell you how it used to be. You know, and, and dinner was a day when it was even pro ball on Sunday. Now I quit them when they quit the flag. But anyway. <laughs> but... See, you know how it used to be. And I forgot that it was even football day. I'm down here praying, making intercession. Glory and writing lessons. And I'm more interested in that. And, that, and we've only been at it a few weeks. Dear Lord. Now just I have a couple of little things to pull out of there. On the, the one that says, you who have ears to hear. I especially notice, continue in a straightforward motion. There's the train. <laughs> Don't get diverted. Continue A train goes in a straight forward motion. All the cars following the same vision. Can I say that? I loved how that's worded there. And he mentioned earlier a few paragraphs. It will, talking about this anointing to do the works that my first begotten did. He said it this way. It will become natural and become a flow. A flow in you. Friday and Saturday I wrote ten pages about the flow. Okay. Just him doing it. There's good things to come. Endure in the fight. Did you notice that one? He says at the very beginning of it, for many of your hearts are turned aside fighting the battle. Some on many fronts. And when he say turns aside means you've been diverted off of going in the straight line because you're fighting this side fight. And he mentioned a few of them, some financially, some physically, some emotionally. For the drain and the fight of the battle has been part of your distraction. Distraction. I have never seen in my walk as a Christian so many people being attacked with a spirit of infirmity. One good way you can know if it's a spirit of infirmity is if you go to the doctors and you go to the doctors and they can't find anything wrong. But the pain is still there or the symptom is still there. If that keeps happening... Especially if there's more than one thing going on at once. Nearly always that is a spirit of infirmity. You have authority over that thing. Begin talking to it. Getting it out of your house and out of your body. Because it's a diversion. He doesn't care how he stops you. Just as long as he stops you. How would he stop me? Quit praying. Don't, or let's say it more like what? Don't go, for, don't go more fully into prayer. And fasting. One other thing on, on one of these. Let me find it. I circled it as we went through there. He talked about the whipping post. Some of you may not have heard the face-to-face documents. He's referring to a statement he made there. Where Jesus himself was at the whipping post when they flogged him. And the teaching there is about fasting. So that's what he's talking about. It's fasting. Okay. And sometimes my body sure thinks it's a whipping post. And then on the he says in another place, if you'll lay down their life, if you will do this, 
you will reap a great harvest. And that is what this is about. It's really about the harvest. The signs and the wonders that many people will have to see or they're never going to take you seriously and they're not going to take Jesus seriously. I'm thinking especially of the Muslim world. I have debated those guys in the prisons. They love their Koran like you love the Bible. They know their Koran probably better than you know the Bible. You can debate with them all day long and at the end of the day, you're both more entrenched than you were when you started. But you take that same guy who's got a blind daughter you lay your hands on that daughter in the name of Jesus and those eyes open, he will want to know about your Jesus. Now that is what we're talking about. Okay? That's what we're talking about. And he says in here, that will never happen, cannot happen without fasting and prayer. He said it himself. All right, this last one is intimacy, and I'm going to make a confession right before we start it. And this probably will be the end of the service, I think. It's a fairly long one. Let's talk about intimacy for just a moment. Because you can be, you can love God. I'm telling you, you can love God, be serving God, be busy with God. And everyone think you're just doing a great, nice job. And uh, that was going on with me. I'm not going to tell you how long ago. It was at least more than a year. <laughs> it's been a little while back. I'd like to tell you a long time back, but it wasn't. And I was going through a season where, man, the revelation knowledge was still flowing. I was getting these teachings. It was good. I knew it was good, and I'm teaching it, and people were getting helped and blessed. But at the same time, man, I just felt kind of empty. I was, you know, and it's not that I wasn't praying. I was, I, but compared to how it used to be, you know, I'd get up maybe two hours in the morning, and I don't want to intimidate anybody, but for Gary, that's not a whole lot. I mean, that's just not how it used to be, Okay. So I was receiving the teachings, but very little presence, very little him just talking with me, like in the cool of the day, you allow me? And so I asked him, I said, what's, how come, how come, what's going on? You're still giving me the teachings, but very little of yourself, presence. And I hate to say this, but I want to tell you because I love you enough, and I want change. He said to me, he said to me, well, I'm giving you what you are interested in. You have proven to me that you are not interested in intimacy. Dagger through the heart. Dagger through the heart. And I'd like to tell you I completely 100% changed, but even that wasn't enough to 100%. But he's still getting us there. But it did change. It changed a lot. And that presence is a lot better. But it is nothing compared to what it's going to be. And it's, not going, it's going to go from the pulpit to the pew. I'm telling you, you are Joel's army. One of those prophecies, he said, I want to work all of the gifts of the Spirit through each and every one of you. Get ready. With power comes persecution. Get ready. <laughs> all right. We'll do the last one. And I may say something at the end like you're dismissed. We'll see. <laughs> For many of you are hearing the cry of heaven, saith the Spirit of grace. For I'm saying unto you in your spirit, that compass that is beyond all reason, it's beyond the mind, it's deeper an intellectual thought the cry of heaven is for you to come away come away with me saith the spirit of grace to you that are hearing this cry to you it feels like that there's a desire inside of you you'd just be satisfied to go and sit somewhere and exhaust yourself in prayer, praying the mysteries until nothing was left, hour after hour, moment after moment. This is the cry that I'm giving to the church that has ears to hear. Come away with me, my beloved. Come away with me. For I must woo you into a place of intimacy to have you as the forerunners to this great outpouring. 
Will you do it? Will you come away? Will you find that private place and that corporate place to seek me and to sit and come away? Will you push back the hours and find room for me and sacrifice time? Will you find the way through my wisdom to steal moments and time to pray and intercede for I'm laying on my church male and female young and old a desire to pray a desire to intercede even those who do not consider themselves as intercessors I'm laying upon you the burden of intercession for I, did I not say that my yoke is easy and my burden is light there's a refreshing in this burden all who take it on all who receive it and embrace it find life saith the spirit of the Lord there is a death to the flesh but a life to the spirit the trade off is beyond measure saith the spirit of grace the trade off is beyond measure seek me find opportunity Find excuses to steal away and sit with me and pray. So much depends on you. You've not even yet realized how much depends on you. You've not yet realized how jealous I am over you. I'm very jealous very jealous in a godly manner over you saith the spirit of the lord for i birthed you for this reason and therefore like a mother that would protect her children like a father that would watch over and keep back that which would come in to molest and to destroy my spirit watches over this place and all other places where this cry is going out and where ears, spiritual ears, are being able to hear these things, saith the Lord. I'm very gentle with those. I put on your right hand and on your left bumper rails to cause you to be able to know Yes to this and no to that, because all things, though they are lawful, they are not expedient. Though many things might be permissible, they're not expedient to you that are hearing this cry from heaven. Come away, come away, come away with me, my sons and daughters. Long after lust lust after with a godly lust with a desire that exceeds all desires in this earth to know me in intimacy there's a reward for you not just in heavenly places in times to come but there is a reward present tense saith the spirit of grace when i wrap my arms around you and use you in intercession to change many things in the days ahead when you watch these things I'll witness to you on the inside your prayers did these things your prayers opened up an avenue for this one to be healed and that one to be delivered and many things to be set in the progress this outpouring you'll rejoice you'll be exceeding glad when others can understand your joy you'll be like a mother that gave birth both male and female you'll understand the joy of giving birth I've called you I saw you before you were born having a timelessness in myself and I desired many, many to go this route. But by your own election, you've chosen. So I come to you 
with a jealousy. I come to you with a desire. And I'm placing that desire stronger and stronger inside of you. Pecaroso. Mega lo crosete. Incredible gladness is in front of you in the days ahead, saith the Spirit of Grace. You'll be glad for every moment that you fought back the temptation to quit. You'll be glad for every moment that you walk past an offense that could have diverted you from the right hand to the left. You'll watch the children come in, the little ones that'll be healed. You'll watch people from all walks of life come in and be healed. Yes, the children coming out of the groves, coming out of the pastures, coming out of places of obscurity, you'll watch them be healed. And you trade another ten lives for more of the opportunity to give yourself over to this divine inner intercession saith the spirit of grace intimacy is the hour that you live in I call you I call you apart I desire you as a jealous husband with a godly desire for that which he has received that which has been given to him my father has given me my espoused bride and I'm very jealous over you I hold you with the greatest regards I nurture you wherever I can and I fill you wherever I can when you give me this come away with me come away with me my bride Clear enough? And we repeat, repeat back three sentences out of that prophecy. Come away with me, my beloved, for I must woo you into a place of intimacy to have you as the forerunners of this great outpouring. Will you do it? Will you come away? Will you find that private place and that corporate place to seek me and to sit and to come away. Will you do it? And I'm thinking of the Ephesus church at Ephesus after the Lord gave them instruction return unto your first love and do the first works. After he spoke that through John, after, he, after they heard that would it have been okay to say we're going to increase our feeding program to the poor? Uh, we're going to increase our evangelism in the streets. We're going to enlarge our Bible college. Would anything else be okay except what the Lord had said? I think the Lord is saying to us, clear and plain, come away with Him. He's saying, come away with me. Private prayer, corporate prayer, fasting. Worship in my word. Come away with me. I say we'll do it. I say we will do it.